While you're waiting, um, please look on your screen. We have posted the program so you have an idea of uh, the fabulous programming about to see. Also, if you are getting CMEs today, make sure that you uh, sign in for your attendance so that you get your CMEs today. If you haven't signed in for your CMEs, it takes just a minute or two. There should be a link in your chat room from CMRA if you haven't signed in already. Okay, thank you. If you're joining us right now, uh, I just wanna go over the CME uh, details. If you've signed in for CMEs today, the activity sign-in code is 18CRAM, C-R-A-M. We did not ask for that number, somehow we got it. So it's, uh, it's kind of cute. Um, you can text that code to 828-295-1144. Or sign in at eeds.com. Today, today's event disclosure is that Dr. Truesdale, Dr. Moreira Sarmiento, Dr. Alamani, Dr. Perez Gutierrez have no relevant financial relationships to report in um, and with a commercial interest. So this activity is not commercially supported. All right, great. I think we're ready to start. Uh, my pleasure to begin uh, by welcoming Dr. Dr. Warren Siegel, our PACI board member and Research Day 2020 judge. Dr. Siegel. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Warren Siegel. I'm the chair of the Department of Pediatrics here at Coney Island Hospital. And more importantly, tonight, uh, I'm representing the Board of PAGME. And on behalf of Dr. Bijan Safai, our president and the entire PAGME board, I want to uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, uh, this is a very significant day. Uh, uh, PAGME has prioritized uh, research. And four years ago, we began this journey to make sure that our foundation supported the wonderful research that we do within PAGNI. Your research efforts, whether you're asking about the social determinants of health, looking and, and, and trying to understand uh, the disease process itself uh, has a direct effect on every community that we serve. And it's a demonstration of our commitment to excellence in patient care. So we're very excited to provide this venue tonight uh, for us to be able to share all the work that you're doing within our PAGNI family. So with that said, I'm gonna once again, thank you on behalf of the board of directors, uh, and I will hand the program off to our health and, and research foundation executive director, Suhina De O'Connor. And uh, once again, enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Siegel, for that lovely introduction. And thanks for being here today to greet everybody. Uh, thank you to all of our esteemed physicians, supporters, and guests for joining us today for the fifth annual Research Day, sponsored by the Pagni Health and Research Foundation and the New York City Precision Medicine Consortium, who is our sponsor today. It is a real testament to Pagni's strength that so many of you made time to do research and submit abstracts, despite this very challenging year. Out of 58 submissions, 14 abstracts were COVID related, illustrating your commitment to address the issues most critical to public health and your desire to make a far reaching contribution. I first wanna just take care of some housekeeping issues. 
before we begin. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be available on our website. Uh, we will have uh, questions and answers after each oral presentation. So please feel free to unmute at those times or type your questions into the chat room and Ciamara will be reading those questions off. Please also respond to the evaluation survey that will be sent to you post-program, which is required for CME and it really does provide us great feedback. Uh, also the 2020 abstract compendium and the 2019 poster compendium are available on our website at the link that you see below. So some of you are not familiar with PAGNI guests joining us today. Uh, so I just wanted to do a quick overview. PAGNI uh, Physician Affiliate Group of New York is one of the largest physician groups in the US and serves roughly a million uh, residents in seven of the 11 public hospitals within the New York City Health and Hospital System, as well as their Gotham Health Clinic and the Correctional Health Services. Who does PAGNI serve? PAGNI's patients include New York City's most vulnerable residents, typically uninsured and underinsured black and brown individuals, especially hard, hit hard this year by COVID. What is the mission of PAGNI Health and Research Foundation? Well, as Dr. Siegel said, uh, that the board of PAGNI uh, really is committed to research and they founded the foundation in 2016. And it, we are committed to promoting health, health equity for the marginalized communities that PAGNI serves. How does uh, PAGNI Health and Research Foundation achieve our mission? Well, we seek funding for PAGNI providers for population health research that they're doing. And we facilitate programs and community partnerships and develop professional trainings to support excellence in healthcare. Just a few of the highlights from the Research Foundation this year, just so you know what we've been up to. We did raise a, a, a couple hundred emergency COVID funds to provide COVID trauma relief and emotional support programs, PPE, and disinfecting needs for our Pagni frontline healthcare workers. I hope you've all been able to participate in some of this um, going on right now. We secured uh, almost a half, uh, over a half a million dollars to study model immunotherapies for malignant melanoma. We spearheaded a Harlem-based childhood asthma prevention program, which is currently being filmed. We will have video and outreach materials. And um, some of you are very familiar with our physician leadership development program. I'm so excited to tell you that we graduated 80 clinicians in the eight cohort cohorts that we have done in two years. And we just started a new one and have 22 new enrollees in it. Um, we also have a new program we launched this year, the Physician Coaching Program, just training 23 physician leaders to expertly coach medical teams to facilitate resilience and excellence in the face of all the challenging times ahead. I want to say thank you for allowing these programs to be possible. We really cannot do it without your support and your continued, continued generosity, uh, we really owe it to you and hope to provide many, many programs in the future. Okay, that being said, I want to give a special thank you to our research day judges, one of which was Dr. Siegel. Um, and uh, you can see we had a, a cross-facility um, group of of wonderful people that volunteered their time uh, so and, and were able to call through the 58 abstracts to come up with today's uh, three very best in program. So thank you, judges. And before uh, we start the presentations um, of the three top abstracts, I wanted to mention that we do have several that uh, projects that did very well, and we call them honorable mentions. Um, the researchers on these received uh, a $250 honorarium, 
And these projects will be featured in virtual poster sessions scheduled from now through the beginning of March about. Um, and we will be sending out a calendar so that you can see them all. We hope you will um, join as many as you can. They were going to be about 30 minutes. Um, and I hope to offer CME for that. <laughs> Um, just another page of these excellent, excellent projects just so that you can get a taste. Congratulations to all of you as well. Now I turn to our sponsor. This year's research day was made possible by our sponsor, the New York City Precision Medicine Consortium and the All of Us Database Research Project. Uh, the, the project is certain to be a benefit to your research and your clinical work in the future. So I think you will find the in, this program very interesting. We are lucky enough to have Dr. Rhonda Truesdale from Harlem to give you a little um, idea of the project and what you can expect. Good evening, my name is Dr. Rhonda Truesdale and I am a principal investigator for the New York City Consortium of the National All of Us Research Program. We are proud to be a sponsor of tonight's event, the PAGNI Annual Research Day. I would like to take a few minutes to introduce the All of Us Research Program as well as two projects that are coming up. The All of Us Research Program started as part of President Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative. So what is precision medicine? It's an emerging approach for disease, both treatment and prevention, that takes into account individual variability in lifestyle, environment, and biological makeup. The goal of the program is to develop a research platform to accelerate our understanding of precision medicine. We will be enrolling 1 million or more participants across the United States. And for those participants, we are collecting and standardizing data from a variety of sources, including participant surveys, electronic health records, physical measurements, and biospecimens. One of the mandates for the precision medicine program is diversity. We want to make sure that we reach out to communities that are historically underrepresented in biomedical research. How are we doing with this? Well, at the national level, we've enrolled 440,000 people into the program at some level. 272,000 of them have completed all the steps to be considered fully enrolled. The New York Consortium has enrolled 330,000 people with 26,000 people completing all the steps. What we're most proud of is the fact that at both the New York Consortium and the national level, 70% of our patients are meeting the qualification to be underrepresented in biomedical research. The first project I wanna talk about is genome analysis. From all the biospecimens we've been collecting, we've now started our DNA analysis. The information we will be providing to our participants is ancestry and personal traits, pharmacogenetics, and sequencing. The technique we decided to use for sequencing is the whole genome, so we will be looking at DNA from A to Z. The participants will be asked to choose what genetic results they wish to receive. In order to make this difficult decision, we have free genetic counseling services available. This will help participants, their families, and their providers to make decisions about whether it's right for them to receive their genetic results. If they do decide to receive their results, the genetic counseling services can also assist with understanding the results and providing any standard follow-up recommendations. The second project I wanted to talk about is the researcher workbench. As we said before, participants share their data. The data goes over to the Data and Research Center, which takes all of the information and puts it through a curation process. Anyone can visit the research hub, which has aggregated participant information seen on the Survey Explorer and the data browser. But the most exciting part is that registered researchers can access the researcher workbench in order to do their own research projects. On the workbench, you're able to develop cohorts, ask your question, and do your analysis within the notebook. 
the NIH provides extensive research support for anyone interested in working on the researcher workbench. New York City Health and Hospital has signed an institutional agreement that will allow PAGNI investigators direct access to the research workbench. We anticipate that we will have this access before Christmas. I am also excited that we will be developing and presenting workshops to make sure that people understand how to get onto the workbench and to use the workbench to ask their research questions. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to hearing the winner presentations this evening. So before we move into the presentations, Dr. Truesdale is here, um, and she can answer any questions. So if you have questions about the project, please unmute yourself or type in a question into the chat, and we can read it off. So anybody uh, have something for Dr. Truesdale? Wow, everybody loves this project, I can see. That's great, that means you have no questions, but we're really excited about this project because uh, we are going to be more involved uh, over the next year. And I uh, thank uh, the project and Dr. Truesdale for their $5,000 sponsorship. So as you know, the Public Research Foundation exists to support you in your efforts to do research, but funding and sharing your work and discoveries with your colleagues. As such, we are so excited to present Research Day as an annual opportunity to celebrate your research efforts and acknowledge these successes as Dr. Siegel had just um, recounted. In just a moment, we are going to hear from uh, researchers of the top winning proposals, uh, abstracts, sorry, each presenter will speak for five to seven minutes, and then we will have three minutes of Q&A where you are welcome, again, to unmute, ask your questions, or chat your questions in the chat room. And now, what we've been waiting for, presentations. Here we go. The first one will be predictors of mortality in critically ill patients on mechanical ventilation for COVID-19 infections. The authors of this project are Drs. Perez Gutierrez, Dr. Yu, Dr. Carlos, Dr. Aziz, Drs. Aldiabat, Taveras, Murti, and Dr. Menon. Dr. Menon is the PI and this project was done at Lincoln Medical Center. And our presenter today is Dr. Victor Perez Gutierrez. Hello, this is Victor Perez. I'm PGY2 resident in internal medicine at Lincoln Medical Hospital. With me in this project, Dr. Sherak Murti, who is ICU doctor in our ICU unit, and also Vita Meno, who is the head of research uh, department in our hospital. Today, I would like to talk about predictors of mortality in critically ill patients with COVID-19 infection or mechanical ventilations. And as a background, we know that on March 2020, New York City was declared in the stage of emergency. All the emergency room and hospital facilities in New York City were overwhelmed by the rapid and high influx of patients with COVID-19 infection. That's why the critical care capacity was expanding system-wide in our H&H uh, health system. We increased it from 300 bed ICU capacity at baseline to over 1,000 ICU beds. Similar experience happened in our hospital, in Lincoln Hospital, that we normally have 32 beds. Um, but at that time, we had to increase it to almost 200 ICU beds. Between 5% and 20% of the patients with criteria of hospitalization underwent mechanical ventilation. And for this subset, uh, mortality reached almost 40%, 80%, but I would like to remind you that this was a time where, where the only treatment option was the oxygen support. We decided to study our population at Lincoln because this population is unique. Uh, the South Bronx has a different population compared with the other boroughs in New York City because 
that disparities as an income inequality, housing issue, high prevalence of comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, make this population unique to assess the clinical course and the outcomes. From previous study in New York City, we know that some, there's some predictor of mortality, like uh, older than 65 years old, obesity, comorbidities like a diabetes and hypertension, length of mechanical ventilation, length of ICU stay, uh, the degree of hypoxemia and the high concentration of biomarkers show that they are predictor of mortality in, in this kind of population. So in this study, we aim to determine the predictor for mortality in mechanical ventilated patients due to COVID-19 infections, and also to describe broad and clinical characteristics in our cohort. We hypothesize that older people with multiple comorbidities and higher batches for exhibit higher likelihood of death. So about, about the methodology, and this study was a retrospective chart review cohort study. It was developed just in Lincoln Hospital. And we collect uh, data from March to May 2020. And we include in our cohort patients who died during the hospital course and patients who were discharged alive from our institution. Some inclusion criteria, uh, older than 18 years old, uh, positive test for COVID-19, on mechanical ventilation admitted to the traditional ICU or the flex ICU. Some exclusion criteria for our uh, study, and that within 24 hours after endotracheal, endotracheal intubation, intubated on the field of transfer from other hospital or mechanical ventilation and patient transferring less than 24 hours after intubation from our hospital. As you can see here in this flow diagram, uh, 2,000 patients came to our hospital and were admitted to our hospital for some kind of viral syndrome. From then, 1,074 patients were positive for COVID-19 and 394 patients were mechanically ventilated. After exclusion criteria, we included 354 patients to our study. From, from them, 291 patients died during the hospital course, and 82 patients were discharged alive from our institution. This table displays the univariate analysis for mortality in mechanically ventilated patients due to COVID-19 infection. And we, what we try to do in this table is to compare the frequency for all uh, these variables that include uh, broad characteristics, uh, clinical course uh, features, index, and uh, evaluate the severity of the disease, uh, intervention and treatment, and that we offer at that time, and also some laboratory results between patients who died during the hospital course and patients who were discharged alive from our institution. In that way, we can determine the odds ratio and also the p-value. So the p-value is the, the, last, the last column. You will see on board all the variables that are associated with mortality for a, in our cohort. And you can see age more than 60 years old, critical stage of the disease in COVID-19, uh, sepsis defined by soft score, acute kidney injury, ARDS on admission, vasopressor yours during the hospital course, ARDS protocol, um, platelets less than 200, and creatinine more than four. All these variable are associated with mortality. But if you want to see the real effect of this uh, variable in, in mortality, you have to put it in the, in the same model. You have to put it in the multivariate uh, model analysis. All the variables listed in the left are independent predictor factor of mortality for our cohort. Age more than 60, AKI admission, oxygen supplementation on admission, Apache score more than 18, vasopressor use, uh, hemoglobin less than nine, playlist less, less than 200, creatinine more than, more than four, are associated with uh, mortality. The stronger one was the creatinine more than four, the, the odds ratio was 3.6, and the weaker one was the oxygen supplementation, where the odds ratio was 1.01. The only variable that seemed to uh, reduce the life before mortality in our cohort, it was the ARDS protocol. It was 0 0.4. As a conclusion, 
mortality in mechanical ventilated patients in our cohort was higher. It was 82%. Uh, the World Health Organization guidelines recommend mechanical ventilation support in COVID-19 infection for patients in ARDS or need support for other function organs. In our cohort, older than age, more than uh, more than 60, again, admission, ARDS on admission, and degree of oxygen support, Apache more than 18, are independent predictive factor of mortality in critical ill patients with COVID-19 infection. And ARDS protocol in our cohort showed benefits reducing the life of mortality. And maybe that's what, because COVID-19 produced a diffuse alveolar, alveolar damage in the lung that leads the patient toward ARDS. And also this intervention assured enough oxygen levels in the lung with full confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Pagni, for having me today in the research team. That was wonderful. Thank you, doctor. Um, we again have questions and answers. We have about three minutes. Please uh, introduce yourself if you have a question, unmute and ask your question, or you can chat your, uh, type your question into the chat box and we will read it out loud. So we'll give people a minute to think about that. Anybody? That was a very good, good presentation. Thank you. Okay. Anybody, 10, 10 seconds? Okay, great. That went, that went well and nobody has any questions. Wonderful. Okay, so let's go on to presentation two. And the second presentation is appendiceal adenocarcinoma founded by surgery, found by surgery for acute appendicitis is associated with older age. And the authors of this project are Dr. Skandalis, Dr. Ao, Dr. Rao, Dr. McNellis, and Dr. Peter Kim. Uh, also, the PI is Victor Alemany, and he, um, the projects were actually done at Jacoby Medical Center in North Central Bronx Hospital. And uh, the, oops, sorry, the presenter, the presenter is Dr. Victor Alemany. So let's start that. Good afternoon. My name is Victor Alemany. I'm a second year resident for general surgery at the Metropolitan Hospital. And my first co-author is Dr. John Scandellas, who contributed equally to this project. The rest of the team is Dr. O, Dr. Rao, Dr. Magnalis, and Dr. Pierre Kim. Uh, we're going to talk about today about appendiceal adenocarcinoma found during surgery for acute appendicitis and how it is associated with older age of the patient. As a brief background and introduction on acute appendicitis, the incidence is about 100 patients for every 100,000 population per year, which means a lifetime risk of about 7%. That means that surgeons perform every year over 300,000 appendectomies only in the United States. That being said, it is true that there's an increased tendency towards non-operative treatment only with antibiotics, especially coming the, from the influence in Europe where they treat over 40% of their patients with acute appendicitis only with antibiotics and non-appendectomy. That is compared to less than 5% of the patients here in the United States. Our objectives for this project was to determine the incidence of appendiceal neoplasms in two urban municipal hospitals in the Bronx here in New York City. Those are North Central Bronx and Jacoby Medical Center. We also wanted to compare these, these findings to those reported in the literature and the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program or the NISQIP database. Our hypothesis for this project was that older age was associated with a malignant potential of appendiceal neoplasms. To achieve this, what we did is we reviewed the electronic medical records for a nine year period from 2010 to 2018 of patients who underwent appendectomy in, two in these two municipal hospitals. We also examined patients undergoing appendectomy during the same time interval through a query of the NISQIP database. 
Here on the right, you can see the chart for the patients of our local data from these two hospitals in New York City. And you can see that we have over 2,000 patients presented with acute appendicitis in these nine years. And almost all of them underwent surgical treatment for acute appendicitis. Uh, we found a total of 34 patients with uh, appendicial neoplasm that make an incidence of 1.7%. This is compared to the 60 to the 681 patients with uh, appendicial neoplasm that we found uh, when we studied over 150,000 patients on the NISQIP database. Uh, that makes uh, an incidence of 0.53% of appendicial neoplasm. What we found also is that there's an increased incidence of appendicial carcinoma by age in both data, in both groups. As we can see here on the left, this is the graph of our local data from these two hospitals in New York City. And we can see how the incidence of appendicial neoplasms increase with age. Here in blue, we can see the incidence of adenocarcinoma, and we can see it's relevant that we didn't find any case of adenocarcinoma when the patients were young or 40 years old. In red, you can see the neuroendocrine tumor, also called in the literature as a carcinoids. And in yellow, we can see the incidence of low-grade appendicial mucinous neoplasm. In green, there are the three cases that we found that were appendicial metastasis. Here on the right, uh, you can appreciate the graph for the NISQIP data, uh, which we also can see a pretty evident increase in incidence of appendicial neoplasm with age. Uh, here in blue, uh, we also can see the adenocarcinoma incidence and how it increased with the age. And in red, we can see the neuroendocrine tumor. In yellow is the unspecified appendicial neoplasm because the NISQIP database does not specify in, uh, apart from the adenocarcinoma versus neuroendocrine tumors. So what we wanted to study the variables of the patients and the different data that we got, we found, as you can see here, with a P of 0 0.035, is that age was the only statistically relevant variable that was compared and was related to the incidence of appendicial neoplasm. All the rest of the variables that we studied were not statistically relevant. Either the sex, previous screening colonoscopy in the past, uh, imaging size of the appendix, the presentation of the patient or the operative intervention, none of those variables were uh, related to like, an increased incidence of appendicial neoplasm. For all these reasons and with all this data, what we can conclude is that we as a surgeons and as a ED doctors, we really need to consider when we have a patient that it's 40 years old or older and presents to the AD or to our clinic with acute appendicitis, we really need to consider the presence of appendicial neoplasm in that setting of acute appendicitis. This is even more relevant now, a days with the increased uh, influence of non-operative treatment due to COVID and also with the recent literature, especially the CODA trial, uh, which is, stands for Comparison of Outcomes of Drugs and Appendectomy, is a recent randomized trial that was recently published in the British Medical Journal in October. And it shows statistically that there is no inferiority of IV antibiotics compared to appendectomy. So given all this influence, this new era with COVID where we can and we are not doing appendectomies for patients that present with COVID and with all this literature pushing towards treatment of appendicitis with only IV antibiotics and only antibiotic treatment with non-operative treatment, uh, we also need to consider that if we undergo this path, if we treat these patients with only antibiotics, we really need to consider an interval appendectomy in the future, or we really need to uh, book the patient for further cancer screening and surveillance in the future, because these patients that are 40 years or older, they have an increased risk for appendicial neoplasms. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, especially the Piney Health and Research Foundation for making this possible. And now we can answer some questions. 
Fantastic. Thank you, doctor. That was fascinating. Any questions? Please unmute yourself. Feel free to ask Dr. Alamani the questions that you have, or you can type them into the chat box. Last chance. Okay, fantastic. Again, another great, great presentation. And last, we, have, we do have one question. Oh, okay, uh, sorry. From Alexander Petrier. How often yeah. do malignancies metastasis require further treatment beyond appendectomy? Um, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alexander Petri, for the question. Um, uh, it depends. It depends on the diagnosis. Uh, in the case of adenocarcinoma or uh, neuroendocrine tumor, uh, there are some guidelines from the NAC that uh, tell us that if uh, it's larger than two centimeters, on it's embedding the submucosa, which means uh, it's a T2 tumor. Uh, we require, we need to do a right hemicolectomy and treat it as a colorectal cancer. Uh, staging the patient with a CT abdomen pelvis and taking out the entire right column uh, with uh, 12 lymph nodes, the uh, same as we do with the colon cancer. Um, or the, the other type of cancer, the low mucinous neoplasm and the neuroendocrine tumor, uh, these are more benign, these are considered benign and most of the time if they are small and they are at the tip of the appendix, and you do an appendectomy, you are supposed to cure the patient. You are mostly done unless it's larger or it's closer to the base of the appendix. Great, thank you so much for that, Victor. So we have another more question from Dr. Liang and it states, were there, were there any differences, differences in imaging for appendicitis neoplasm versus acute appendicitis? Uh, thank you. Uh, Tian Liang. Uh, no, uh, the truth is no, there is not. Uh, that's one of the variables that we studied. We studied the imaging size uh, in the CAT scans and there is no difference. Uh, there, are some, there are some appendix that present uh, really with a diameter of up to two centimeters or larger and they are just acute appendicitis. It's just the inflammation. Uh, and there are some tumors that are really small that are in the base or the, they are not even causing obst uh, obstruction of the appendix and they, they are adenocarcinoma of the appendix. Um, we ran the data and there was no statistically relevance uh, in any of the imaging findings uh, to the incidence of uh, appendicial neoplasm. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we uh, have any more questions? One more question, maybe. Siamara, any any that are typed in? Uh, no. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for those great questions. Thank you, Doctor, for responding so well to those questions. Uh, next, last but not least, as far as oral presentations. We have short-term impact of COVID-19 pandemic in mental and social determinants of health in ambulatory care populations in South Bronx. And there are a, there's a huge team of people who put this together. I will do this as quickly as I can. Doctors Morera, Perez Gutierrez, Taveras Rodriguez, Nino, Patel, Gomez, Miller, Yanga, Patma Kamur, Persia, Nematova, Rabi, Reyes, Gosai, Valdez, Jackson, Nasser Edding, Venu Gopal, Fisher, and Dr. Menon. Dr. Menon is also the PI of this project, and the project was done at Lincoln Hospital. And the presenter is Carolina Morera, Dr. Carolina Moreira. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Carolina Moreira. I'm a second year resident of the internal medicine program at Lincoln Medical and Mental Health Center. 
Uh, today, we'd like to present the short-term impact of COVID-19 pandemic and mental and social determinants of health in the ambulatory care population in the South Bronx. Uh, this is a pilot study um, that along with uh, Dr. Vidya Menon and Lara Rabi, uh, Masters in Health Science in the whole Department of Ambulatory Care Clinic in our hospital um, worked on. So the first case of COVID-19 was on March the 1st of 2020. This was in New York State. The virus grew rapidly and spread um, exponentially. By March the 25th of 2020, there were about 20,000 cases only in New York City. This led to implementing specific measures, including the shutdown, social distancing, and working from home. All of these actions led to a significant impact with increasing rates of unemployment and poverty, displaying that social inequality plays a vital role in morbidity and mortality, including mental health and substance abuse. The objective of our study was to describe the demographic characteristics, as well as to evaluate the impact of the COVID-19 outbreak on social needs, well-being, mental health, and the alcohol use in South Bronx population. The methodology, this was a cross-sectional study, including 173 participants who agreed to complete the standardized surveys, including PHQ-9 scales, PTSD scales, and GAD-7 scales. The surveys were conducted between the months of May through September. As far as the results, the demographics, we found that most of our participants were female, corresponding to a 60.7%. Most of them were identified ethnically as Latinx. This corresponds to 73.5% of, of our participants, and 21.5% identified themselves as Black. This proficiency was very low amongst our participants, since 23% of them admitted to not speak in English well, and 25.5% of them said that they do not speak English at all. The degree and the level of education was very important to note too, since 31% of them did not go to high school and 19.5% did not finish high school. Uh, on the other hand, we have only seven participants who had a graduate degree. As far as the impact of the outbreak on mental health, we found out that 16.2% had uh, presented symptoms of depression, 9.2% of them had symptoms of anxiety, and 4.6% of them had symptoms of PTSD. The impact of the outbreak, uh, outbreak in alcohol use did not show uh, that there was an increase in, or significant increase in, in alcohol use. We noted that most of them did not drink alcohol. However, there was a 1% of, um, our, of our participants that admitted on the increased consume of alcohol during this pandemic. As far as the impact of the outbreak on social needs, it's very important to note that 53% of our participants showed at least one social need. Uh, all of these needs included 10% of them needed assistance with social security. 16% uh, of our participants were afraid of losing their house. And 6.5% um, of them um, exposed a immigration or legal problems. As far as the loss of income, there was a 23% of our participants who lost their income. And it's important to know that uh, the group of age was these patients were less than 35 years old, and this was the majority of the group who lost the in, the, their income. 20% of them lost someone close due to COVID-19. 16.2% of them needed help either with health insurance, medical bills, or medication costs. And 19.7% were worried about running out of food. After all of these, um, we come to the conclusion that anxiety disorder, low education level, and poor self-perception of health was very significant among the, the patients who delayed their care due to pandemic uh, than those who did not delay their care. Nearly a quarter of respondents, this is 48 out of the 173, had symptoms associated with COVID, reflect, reflecting that Bronx was really an epicenter for this pandemic. 
um, there were three groups that were most likely to have um, symptoms, and these were basically the ones needing immigration help, those with a family member who tested positive at home, and those who had anxiety. 13% of our respondents said that they either delayed or did not get care for an acute condition other than COVID. We mentioned stroke and, a, and heart attack. And uh, the main reason was because they were scared to get coronavirus by leaving their house or by going to a medical provider. This leads me to the discussion. Um, Latinx ethnicity is predominant among the study population, similar to other cohorts in New York City. The prevalence of depression and anxiety in other cross-sectional studies are also consistent with our data. Illicit drug use was increased during the outbreak. However, there was no notable difference um, in alcohol use. There was also a very important um, increase in the need for economic, legal, social, and emotional support. There were five major resource needs that emerged once the pandemic started, and these were food, mental health, substance abuse support, child care, supporting programs for vulnerable populations, direct health care service. Language barriers were an essential factor. Most of our participants have low English and English proficiency skills. And all these external factors impact mental health and could be contributors to substance abuse as well. What we want to do with the, this results is to promote social projects and educate the community about the resources available at the moment. Our conclusion is that the impact of the coronavirus pandemic was strongly associated with the disparities portrayed among South Bronx community, characterized statistically by the low level of education and a significant language barrier. It is important to identify population in risk in order to prevent mental health and substance abuse problems, as well as to provide resources available to those whose social needs have increased. Thank you very much. I had myself on mute, excuse me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marrera, that was uh, wonderful. Very excellent presentation. Do we have any questions for her? Uh, either you can unmute or type your question into the chat box. Anybody? Excellent. Um, thank you all for those amazing uh, presentations. Um, you all deserve uh, of such accolades for all the hard work you did in bringing this information forward to all your colleagues. So without further ado, it is now my pleasure to introduce PAGNI CEO and PAGNI Health and Research Board Member and Treasurer, Dr. Luis Marcos, our fearless leader, who will announce the winners of today's programs and offer closing remarks. Take it away, Dr. Marcos. Thank you. Thank you very much to Hina. And thanks to all of you who not only work tirelessly for the past nine, 10 months, to save New Yorkers, but carve out time to work with your colleagues to answer critical research questions. Your curiosity and commitment to continually seeking better ways to provide care, including through research, are what makes PAGNI a center of excellence. The fact that nearly one in four of the projects were related to COVID demonstrates your quest to address the most pressing issues affecting our communities and indeed the world. The Pagni Health and Research Foundation is focused on building a research program of distinction. We are well on our way to project projects like Dr. Aniagus, for example, uh, teen options for pregnancy prevention or Dr. Uh, Wallach uh, from uh, Metropolitan study on immunotherapies to combat malignancy melanoma. We are here for you, gathering resources, cultivating funding relationships, and collaborating with health and hospitals to support research in the facilities where PAGNI clinicians 
devote their time, energy, and an enormous compassion. Our flagship Research Day event today was designed to encourage collaboration and sharing among clinicians across PAGNI facilities. And we're pleased to have raised funds for significant cash prices this year. And I'm even more pleased to have the privilege of announcing the winners. Are you ready? Yeah, okay, here we go. <clears throat> we start um, with our third place winning abstract. And that abstract is appendiceal adenocarcinoma found by surgery for acute appendicitis and associated with older age. And the, the, the PI, the principal investigator, is Dr. Victor Alemani, who uh, presented to us today uh, this uh, great research done at Jacobi. And Dr. Alemani uh, is a physician working in the Department of Surgery at Metropolitan Hospital. Dr. Alemani, we're pleased to present this certificate to you. And wait for this, a cash price of $2,500 for your continued research effort. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. I said it already, but thank you, especially to the Pagni Health and Research Foundation for making this possible, even in these special uh, circumstances. Uh, hopefully next year we can meet all again together in the New York Academy of Medicine. Great, thank you. Our second place um, winning abstract is predictors of mortality in critically ill patients on mechanical ventilation for COVID-19 infections. The PI is Dr. Vida Menon from the Department of Medicine at uh, Lincoln Hospital Center. Dr. Vidya Menon, we are very, very pleased to present this certificate to you and your team. And a cash price, wait for this, a cash price of $5,000 for your continued research. Dr. Menon, I am also pleased to inform you that our, are you ready for this? That our first place winning abstract is also one of your team submissions. This is incredible, huh, Dr. Menon? Thank you so much. The title is Short-Term Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic in Mental and Social Determinants of Health in Ambulatory Care Population in the South Bronx, a pilot study. Once again, Dr. Menon, we're pleased to present this certificate a plaque to, for your team and a cash prize, ready for this, of $10,000 for your continued research. Congratulations to all of you and your teams. Now, would any of the winners like to say a few words? Uh, if I may, Dr. Marcos, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marcos, Zivina, uh, 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 Ziomara, and the entire Pagni research team for allowing us the opportunity to present our work. Um, none of this would have been possible without uh, support and uh, the uh, continued uh, work and sacrifice of all our healthcare workers uh, during this crisis. Um, we, uh, this was just an example of what uh, we experienced and what we learned from our experience during these unprecedented times. Thank you very much again from our entire team at Lincoln, uh, from the Department of Medicine, and all our uh, support team here at Lincoln. Thank you very much. Congrats to the winning team. Yes. yes. To all of you. Great job, everyone. Great job, everyone. Great. Any other any other words from any any anyone in the uh, 
Okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to you, to Hina. Oh, but guess what? You are doing the closing. So back to you, sir. Okay, so are you ready for the closing? Don't tell me that you're, you're eager for the closing. That's not the point. You're, you're ready for it. And uh, what can I say? Uh, congratulations. And I'd like to thank all of our research day participants and all of our STEAM colleagues for your continuing hard work, your dedication and fearlessness in the face of the pandemic. We will get through this together. Thank you for joining us today. Have a blessed holiday and a healthy, safe and peaceful new year.